From the Aspen Institute in Aspen, Colorado, this is day four of the 2020 Aspen Ideas Festival. From the Institute campus, please welcome again co-founder of the Aspen Ideas Festival, Vice President of Public Programs for the Aspen Institute, Kitty Boone. Welcome to day four of Aspen Ideas Festival. I hope you've had a chance to join us for the previous three days of programming during this virtual version of our festival. In a normal year, a day at the festival will be packed with a wide variety of sessions, exploring all kinds of different thoughts, ideas, and issues. There will be performances and films, round tables and panel discussions, recordings of radio shows and podcasts, hot debates, concerts, picnics, and I confess, sunrise yoga. The point of the Aspen Ideas Festival, though, this exercise here and now, is to elevate ideas in ways that we can imagine a better and more equitable future. Welcome. Day four lineup includes Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and Angela Rye, Walter Isaacson and Susan Goldberg, John McWhorter and Eric Larson, Hank Paulson and Jillian Tech, a recital of the poem From Out the Cave, additional big ideas, and a special performance by Emily Bersan, an American soprano. Up first, one of those big ideas on space exploration and equity. My name is Lakshmi Karan and I am the CEO of Future Frontiers Institute. My big idea is a global space initiative that benefits all humans. In a couple of decades, we will be an interplanetary species. There's a space race right now to colonize the moon and beyond, where the motivation is competition, greed, and power. We know how that will end, and we mustn't repeat those mistakes. What we need is a global initiative that transcends borders, races, and privileges that builds on what unites us as humans so we can ensure a future that is just, equitable, and sustainable. The benefits from space must go to the poorest child as they will to the richest man, where the wisdom of the indigenous peoples is as valued as the smartest scientist, where arts, humanities, ethics are seen as essential as science and technology. The next giant leap for humanity must represent our collective best and benefit all humans in space and here on Earth. Thank you. And now the first Aspen Ideas conversation of the day with Angela Rye and Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Hello, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. How are you? I am Still standing, I'm doing good, and I'm so glad to see you and hear your voice. Same here. Uh, well, th for those of you who don't know, I love to call her Mayor Keisha, but for this panel, I'm going to call her Mayor Bottoms. Uh, mayor Bottoms, you are the 60th mayor in Atlanta, um, only the second Black woman. Talk about some of the pressure that comes with um, that reality. Now, Angela, the past few months, really, I think have been the most challenging that I've had as mayor and especially uh, now that so much of what we're seeing happening across the country really is happening we we become the epicenter in Atlanta and it it, it is it, it's not been easy and that's why when you asked how I was doing I believe in giving honest answers and um, my honesty right now is we're still standing because that's what each day is about getting up every day and trying to get it right again. Um, but nobody said this job was going to be easy. Um, you can't script what's happened really across the globe um, between COVID-19 and this movement that we're seeing happening. And so it's, um, I, I've been saying, uh, my, my dear friend Killer Mike and I were texting and, and he asked how I was doing and I said, the grace of God is sufficient. And that's really um, so much of what I'm personally standing on right now, my faith, but also being a woman and, and how we feel and how we think and how we see our communities and just merging all of that together and hopefully making the best decisions um, that are, are best for the people I've been elected to serve. I love that. And, and one of the things that I think is probably, um, and I don't want to speak for you, but I think probably particularly challenging in this moment is 
you're being um, forced to toggle between your humanity and your elected position and your blackness all at once in lots of respects. And as it relates to COVID-19, as it relates to what's happening in the city around um, the death of Rayshard Brooks and so many others, um, how are you doing that? And, and talk about one of your most recent moments where you really struggle to, okay, should I be fully human in this moment? Do I have to kind of uh, tamp that down so that I can be um, elected Mayor Bottoms? How do you kind of go between those, those two or really those three realities? I think of something my mother always tells me and she says, you only have to tell the truth once. And something I learned about myself during my mayor's race, which was a, a really long, nasty race, is that the more exhausted I became, the more authentic I became. And I'm, I'm seeing that reflected now. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, it takes a lot of energy to be something you're not in the moment. And quite frankly, I don't have the interest in giving energy to that. So all I am interested in giving energy to is what's before me and not trying to appear to be something else. I think that's, if anything, that's why people are getting it unfiltered. And I, and I you know, I'd be less than honest if I didn't say there are times after I, I speak, I go, oh, is that really what I should have said then? Um, but you know, it's it's who I am and it's how I'm feeling. And what I know is that what I'm feeling is probably a reflection of what the rest of the country is feeling right now. Sometimes you're angry. Sometimes you're upset. Sometimes you feel helpless. I, I think we're all going through this range of emotions and, you know, mine just gets reflected on television. Yeah. Is there a recent moment where you, where you said, dang, I shouldn't have said that? that um that's kind of sticks with you right now yeah um, <laughs> um you know when uh, after um uh, the killing of rayshard brooks and um a reporter asked me I, I can't remember the question i think it was how i felt and i said i'm pissed off and mm -hmm. as soon as i said it i thought oh gosh can i use that word in front of my mother because she's gonna see it so, you know, I mean, that's the, the hu human side because I, I still think, wonder what my mom is going to yes. think, my kids and my husband. Um, but it really, it reflected how I, how I felt in that moment and, and how I still struggle with those feelings. Um, but for me, Angela, you know, my kids are such a center for me. My 12-year-old asked me if he could go to the funeral with me. And um, he stays up all night now because he's all in the club quarantine. So he thinks he's a DJ. So he keeps <laughs> DJ hours. But he got his suit out. He ironed his suit and went to the funeral with me. And um, after we came home, he said he was a, a good looking man. And he seemed like a really nice man. He didn't deserve to die that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's my reminder that our kids are watching everything and they're forming their, their opinions and they're looking to us to fix it. Yeah. And, you know, that's, I think, what we're all struggling with across this country, trying to fix it. And the one thing that Mr. Brooks's widow asked of me was that his death not be in vain. So that's, <laughs> That's motivation in and of itself. That's so powerful. You know, the, the other thing that comes to mind is um, there's a lot of conversation, as you know, around defund the police, um, which is, you know, a divestment effort from the police departments to invest in safer communities. And so often, you know, people in the Democratic Party, Republican Party, somewhere in between, when they hear it, they're like, ah, no, we can't do that. But we never have um, issues when we talk about basically defunding Social Security. I won't say we, some people never have issues. Um, or taking money away and resources away from schools. Why do you think that is such a jarring concept for people, even from a conversation starter? So some people said they threw it out there and they threw it out there in three words or Black Lives Matter, right? They threw out Black Lives Matter in three words. And even when folks first started saying that after Trayvon's death, it was an argument. 
Black Lives Matter just started becoming an affirmation that everybody could really support and believe in. So when you hear about that, to me, you, you are such an effective leader because you don't automatically shut ideas down. So when people start there, what, do, what is your response to defund the police or divest from the police um, to invest in communities? How do you respond to that big idea right now? So the way I respond, Angela, is I tell people you've got to look at the sentiment and not necessarily the slogan. Hmm. Um, and and I've, I've been pulling up a lot of props lately. So one of, one of my props, this is my city budget book. Hmm. This is a really complex document. And if I were to go into my mother's bridge club meeting and I said, we're going to defund the police, they would go nuts mm -hmm. because they want more police and they want, they want to see police and they want to feel protected. But if I said, we've already looked at our corrections budget, we've slashed our corrections budget by more than half. We're reallocating our corrections budget with personnel to community-based initiatives because we're closing our city jail. We're transforming it into a center of equity and health and wellness. And this is how we're now gonna spend our dollars. They would applaud that because that makes sense to them. And so I just think for so many of us, it's important that we don't stop at the message because sometimes the sentiment gets lost in the message Mm -hmm. But it doesn't remove the responsibility of us to look at these complex budgets and then to say, how am I going to spend my taxpayer dollars that we've been entrusted to spend to make sure that our communities are healthy and whole? It may not be from your police budget, but it may be a reallocation of some other dollars. For us in Atlanta, it's been for our corrections budget to try and achieve the same thing. And I think that we, um, I don't think either side, whether you're for it or against it, needs to stop at the messaging. I think we just need to, to move forward and get the work done. Yeah, that's, and that's another powerful thing. Again, it, it demonstrates, you know, all of the breadth of experience that you took into not only your mayoral race, but your victory. So a lot of people don't know, but you served in every branch of the government as a judge, um, as a state legislator, and then as a mayor. Um, given that um, breadth and depth of experience, Mayor Keisha, you know that you have been placed on a short list um, for a national office, and I think very much so thrust into the national spotlight in the heat of everything that's going on. Um, can you talk for a minute about um, what it's like to have that kind of attention on you um, if this is something that you wanna do, and by this I mean, vice presidency um and then well i'll stop here that's two questions <laughs> well and and it was city council i, I wasn't uh, i'm sorry uh, yes I'm so sorry about that. but still a, a hard job yeah. um and i remember the first time i met vice president biden and he said i used to be on city council i said you did and he said it was harder than being vice president i said it is why he said because everybody knows where you live <laughs> so Ooh, yeah um, and, and now that means people show up at your house with bullhorns at seven o'clock in the morning when they know where you live. That, right. That's what um, this experience has been over the past few months. But um, Angela, there are 330 million people in America. So to have my name spoken, even in this circle and, and at this level, I, I mean, it, it is a really big deal. So I won't, pretend that that it's not a big deal to me to have my name mentioned. But what I've said from the beginning is I want Joe Biden to win. And whoever he thinks is going to help him win and then lead and help heal this country, that's who I'm going to be rooting for. So if, it, if it's me, it's something I would give serious consideration to. And if it's someone else that he thinks is better suited to help him win in November, I mean, there's so much at stake with our country right now and, and with the future for my children and, and our not yet born children. Um, I, I'm going to do and support whomever um, he thinks is best suited to help him get there in November. Well, we're not talking about all of them. We're talking about you. So tell me what, um, what you think um, are some of the things that you bring to the table where Joe Biden 
may have some flat sides or some places where you're like, I know that if I'm on the ticket, these, you know, two or three things get addressed. What are some of those things? So I, t I told you I've been pulling on props and this has been important to me. I did um, some family research probably about 15 years ago. And it's interesting, I, over the past several months, several weeks, I've been touching these documents because they're important to me. Mm -hmm. This is Shepard and Betsy Peak. These are my grandmother's grandparents. They're freed slaves. Mm -hmm. I've been told that he served either in the state legislature or in Congress during Reconstruction. Wow. Um, this is his slave master's will. So. He has chairs, tables, sofa, cupboard, and Shepherd Peak valued at $1,400. This is a document signed by Shepherd Peak with an X. I'm going to assume that he could not read and write. And this is the 1870 census. He thought it important that he be counted. So, when I'm asked about serving as mayor and, and potentially as a running mate and just even being a leader in this moment, I keep going back to this history and all that has been poured into me even before I was born that gives me this truly American experience that most people uh, who, who aren't of my hue don't have. Mm -hmm. And I, this is what I carry in me every day as a leader. I carry that I, I truly am the hope of the slave. Mm. And I carry those experiences and I, I carry that my father was a wonderful man with flaws who suffered with addiction and who went to prison when I was a child. I carry with me uh, watching my mother struggle to make ends meet. And I carry with me all of the hopes and dreams that I have for my children in this country. And I carry it with me because I live it and I work for it each and every day. And I think that's the balance that I would bring to a ticket with Joe Biden. Um, I'm, I'm a mother. I'm a Southerner. I've worked in all three branches of government and there has been no handbook for how we've had to lead over the past several months um, as mayors and governors across this country. And I think it gives you a balance and a perspective that the vast majority of people will never have. And when you think about some of the leadership that you've drawn on, we know recently um, in response to uh, just like the outcry on the streets, one of your things was, listen, if you really want change, you go and vote. Um, we know voting is a first pillar of, you know, building political power, period. But when you think about what is, um, what's happening right now as people go vote, we know what happened in Fulton County. We see, we've seen what happened in um, Kentucky and the voting lines and the number of precincts that are closed. What do you think um, this country needs to do to immediately remedy um, the voter suppression that we see running rampant and all of the challenges that um, voters, particularly voters of color, are experiencing right now? I think we have to vote in such numbers that there's no room for error because quite honestly, right now, there's not a whole lot that we can do because we don't have the Justice Department on our side. We don't even have a neutral justice department that exists right now. We don't have statewide elected secretary of states in so many states who care about voter suppression and, and even acknowledge that it's their responsibility to fix it. So be that as it may, we are where we are, but I think it's also on us not to allow there to be room for error. So we're, we're not looking at 2016 where we're losing states by 10,000 votes because people aren't showing up in the numbers that we know that they can show up. I think people have to register to vote and I think they have to show up to vote. And my, my call to action um, has been just reflecting on George Floyd and almost nine minutes that the knee was on his neck. Register nine people to vote, turn out nine people to vote 
and then get nine people to fill out their census form. If we all did that, even if there were the most massive voter suppression that's ever happened, we could have our numbers so high that there is no margin for error and there, there won't be any questions about how elections um, have gone one way or the other. I love that. Nine people, register nine people to vote, bring nine people to vote with you if you have a sprinter van. If not, make sure they all turn out and then making sure that nine of us fill out our census. That's wonderful, Mayor Keisha. I know we haven't um, talked as much about coronavirus and I, and I don't want to um, end this panel without doing that. So I just want to know what the greatest lesson um, coronavirus has taught you so far. Oh gosh, not to take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. that literally in the blink of an eye, everything that you know to be true and to be normal uh, is, is no longer so. And I think more than anything, coronavirus, really, we peel back these layers that we know exist. Even as, as I sit in my home, there is a 10-year life expectancy difference between someone living at my address and someone living on the other side of town, not even 10 miles away from my home. And I think that's what's been exposed during coronavirus. So I think the biggest lesson is we can't just keep talking about uh, these systemic health disparities and how they impact our communities, that we actually have to do something about it. Because in Georgia, we saw the numbers spike with African Americans. We are now seeing the same spike uh, with the Latino community. And what it shows to me is anybody who's vulnerable right now mm -hmm. is going to be susceptible to dying of COVID-19. And, and whether it's COVID-19 or the next wave of something that may come, then we've got to, we, we have to be prepared. And the best way to be prepared is not to just to respond to that thing, but to have a healthy to have healthy communities that can withstand the storm. The one thing that um, stood out to me in looking at your bio is you went to Frederick Douglass High School. And we're in this conversation right now around the importance of substantive versus symbolic change. And there's been a ton of discussion around Confederate mo uh, monuments and Confederate flags and all of this. Do you think that it, is, it makes a notable difference for a black child to go to a high school named after Frederick Douglass versus a high school named after Robert E. Lee or living on a street named after Robert E. Lee? Absolutely, it makes a difference. I mean, I can still quote lines from Frederick Douglass because they were, his, his quotes were on the front of every yearbook. If there's no struggle, there is no progress. Mm -hmm. And I can go on and on and on. And it instilled in, in me as an African-American child, that there was some pride and there was some honor in this name that was reflected in the high school I attended. And if your high school is named Robert E. Lee High School, you're going to think there's honor and pride in his legacy as well. And so I think that we don't want to erase history because I think if you, want, if you erase history, you're doomed to repeat it. But I think there is a way uh, that, that you remember history, um, but that doesn't mean that you have to honor that history. And so I think that this is an opportunity while everybody is listening and everybody is speaking to have a real conversation on how we honor these things in our um, country's past that are still so very painful and quite frankly, insulting to people like me who can pull up documents and show that your ancestors were slaves. It's, it hurts. It hurts. And I think at least for the first time in my lifetime, I feel like we're having a very real conversation about this. And I think that we have to look at all of it. My, to the extent I have concerns, Angela, is that I think in this aggression to for people to move down monuments, et cetera, that they perhaps aren't always taking down the right ones. And I think people probably just need to be a little more educated. Um, 
but I get the sentiment and I think that we need to have a comprehensive conversation and a, a thoughtful discussion on how we move these things out of the public view. I thank you so much, um, Mayor Keisha, for your service to Atlanta, for um, the image that you um, hold and the ways in which you um, govern yourselves and make so many of us proud. And by us, I don't just mean little black girls, I mean old ones too, 40 year olds. Um, but thank you so much for your leadership and for your humanity in this moment. Thank you for all you're doing. Well, and thank you, Angela. The feeling is mutual and you make us all so proud and you make me and so many other people think about things often in ways that we don't even know to think about. So I'm just honored to call you my sister and my friend. Yes, thank you so much. Well, this is Aspen Ideas Fest and we are done. It's a wrap. <laughs> Today, we head to the eastern side of campus for a tour to explore the sculpture Anaconda. Herbert Beyer hand-selected the Carrera marble from central Italy that he carved to make this monumental seven-piece geometric sculpture. Anaconda was first installed in the foyer of Atlantic Richfield's Anaconda building in Denver in 1978 set in a granite reflecting pool in front of a copper wall. The Aspen Institute acquired the sculpture from the Denver Art Museum in 2017, and it was installed in 2019. With the permission of the buyer estate, Anaconda has been re-envisioned as an outdoor sculpture, a field of sage replacing a building lobby and the majestic elk range taking place of that copper wall. The Aspen Ideas Festival is generously underwritten by Allstate, the Mount Sinai Health System, Prudential, and the Walton Family Foundation with support from PayPal and the RISE Fund. And now, another big idea. My name is Leah Thomas and I'm the founder of the Intersectional Environmentalist Platform. And my big idea is intersectional environmentalism, which seeks to make the environmental movement more just for all. After creating the viral Environmentalist for Black Lives Matter graphic, I released my definition of intersectional environmentalism to ensure that Black, Indigenous, and POC voices had a place in our fight to save the planet. I define intersectional environmentalism as a version of environmentalism that advocates for both the protection of people and the planet. It identifies the ways in which injustices happening to marginalized communities and the earth are interconnected. It brings injustices done to the most vulnerable communities and the earth to the forefront and does not minimize or silence social inequality. I believe by advocating for both people and the planet, we can change and save the world. Up next, an Aspen Ideas conversation presented by Aspen Ideas Health. Susan Goldberg and Walter Isaacson. Hello, my name is Susan Goldberg. I'm the editor-in-chief of National Geographic, and I'm joined today by Walter Isaacson, renowned author and professor at Tulane University. And Walter has just written a fascinating new book. Uh, the title is called The Code Breaker, the tale of Jennifer Doudna, CRISPR, and the future of the human race. Walter, I'm so glad you could join me. Thank you so much, Susan, and thanks for all you're doing at National Geographic. It's a great, great 130-year-old institution. Well, thank you. You know, I was so interested that you were doing this book because you've written all kinds of amazing, amazing books about people from Steve Jobs to, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, you know, Albert Einstein, uh, Benjamin Franklin. I would guess that most people have never heard of Jennifer Doudna. So tell me why you decided to write about her. Well, first of all, people are going to hear about her because she and some of her colleagues invented the gene editing technology called CRISPR, which means that in the future, our biggest scientific advance, but in some ways our biggest moral challenge will be, how much do we edit our genes? Do we edit the genes of our children? Do we make them taller or smarter? All these things we're gonna be able to do with genetic engineering technology. She's also a wonderful character. You know, She's an exemplar of somebody who loves basic science but then is able, is able to translate it into tools that we can use. And especially during this COVID crisis, 
the biotechnology of things like CRISPR are what's going to save us. It's going to be able to create tools that will allow us to attack viruses because that's what CRISPR is. It was a system that bacteria developed more than three billion years ago in order to fend off viruses. So I find well, I, that topic very exciting. It is exciting. And I know that the FDA has just approved sort of a, an emergency uh, way that, that CRISPR could be used to do a test for COVID. How is that better or different from the usual virus test? The usual virus test called PCR test, you got to amplify the genetic material. You have to put it through cycles of hot and cold, hot and cold. If you've got a direct test using CRISPR, and there are two great labs, one in Berkeley, that's Jennifer Doudna's, and then Fong Jang's and MIT, that kind of rivals on both coasts. They both developed it where it can just go in and use a detection technology to see if the genetic sequences are there. And so you can program it in for the genetic sen uh, sequences of the COVID-19 virus. But you could also program it for the next virus that comes along, or for SARS or MERS, or for that matter, the flu or anything else. So it will be a wonderful uh, detection technology that you can use for any viruses that come along. Well, and I know that CRISPR is also talked about as a way to detect cancer and to help even, you know, help us find a real cure for different kinds of cancers. Where does that stand? What, what it can do is turn genes on and off. We have genes in our body that can help suppress the spread of tumors. We have genes that cause sometimes a uh, cell to uh, go out of control and become cancerous. So you could use CRISPR in the future, not right now, but you could use it in the future to turn on and off genes that help cause cancer. And for that matter, to create kids that are less susceptible to cancer. Elephants don't get cancer. They have a P53 gene. If you want to engineer those in, you could help the human race not be susceptible to viruses, not be susceptible to cancer. And I will say that China is way ahead of us, about three years ahead of us on using this for cancer. Well, I was, gonna, I was just gonna ask about, about China and also some of the ethical issues. But first, just getting back to that cancer, uh, and and how to you know turn off turn off those those cells that end up you know causing the cancers how far away do we think that is for just regular use you know if if it, you go to the hospital this would be part of your treatment we're already in clinical trials for some forms of cancer suppression as you know very well susan cancer is not a disease cancer is hundreds and thousands of different diseases all changing and all personal so at the moment, CRISPR is mainly being used for sickle cell anemia, for other blood diseases, for congenital blindness, but it's also now starting to be used in clinical trials, meaning it's got to get through these trials this year, but maybe by next year or the year after, we'll start seeing it as a therapy in hospitals. Well, that, that would be great. You know, you mentioned how China is ahead of us and how in the future we might be able to program, um, you know, I guess, unborn children, right, to be less susceptible uh, to cancers. What are the, let's talk about the ethical issues uh, raised by that, because, you know, that's, I guess, a good use, but there might be some other uses, uh, you know, uh, to change the, the genes of children, uh, or I guess before they're born, right, to, right, to have different characteristics. So talk about the ethics of all of this. Yeah, Jennifer Dowd, who's the um, character in my book, which by the way, won't be published until March, but I'm just turning it in this week, as you said at the beginning. But Jennifer Dowd has been leading the effort to try to think through some of these moral issues. But let's do it as we would at Aspen. You figure it out, you say, well, first of all, let's say you could just fix that one letter mutation that causes sickle cell. Wouldn't you do it in your children? The answer is, yeah, yeah, of course. I, there's no upside to having sickle cell. Right. For that matter, cystic fibrosis. Or worse yet, Huntington's disease, which is right. just a devastating thing that's going to kill you by age 50 in a slow, painful way. And those are simple genetic mutations that run in families. And you could edit them out of your family, and you could edit them out of the human species. All right, let's take the next step. 
should we um, edit Jean so that people can be taller? Well, that, that starts getting pretty tricky, right? You know, all of us would like to be, or many of us anyway, I'd like to be a little taller, but is that really what we should be doing? No, and it also is something that doesn't advantage the entire human race. If we all got six inches taller, none of us would actually be better off unless you have a job raising the door jams in people's houses. Uh, but likewise, you can tweak things that will affect memory. That's pretty easily understood, the genetic components of that. So would you want your kids to have a better memory or eventually a better general intelligence? Those are things that could be good, but we're not sure we want to barrel down the slippery slope where society allows rich people to buy good genes for their children. And it's only, as, as Algis Huxley wrote about in Brave New World, you get two types of society, the genetically enhanced and the non, or the movie Gattaca for those who haven't read Brave New World. It is a good question. Where does that start once you, <clears throat> I mean, excuse me, where does that stop once you start it, right? You know, you could be taller, you could be smarter, you could be stronger maybe, you could, but what? where does all of that go? Sports, I mean, if people, are, you know, sports fanatics are doing muscles, that's real easy. There's a gene that stops muscle growth at a certain time when we become mature. If you just tweak that on and off, myostatin. In fact, some of the biohackers, as a biohacker I've uh, interviewed for the book, he's been doing it to himself, just plunging a syringe to turn off the myostatin gene. So if you've got a kid who wants to play you know, basketball, baseball, football, whatever, you'd be tempted to you know, enhance them for muscles. Those are the type of things we'll be able to do. It won't happen for the next five or 10 or maybe 15 years, but I think we got to start figuring it out now. Do you expect that by the time we're ready uh, to be able to do those things, there will be a set of rules that goes along with, you know, along with this ability, or are we going to have the ability before we have the rules? You know, science has always progressed and it tries to keep in tandem with our moral processing power. Every now and then we don't quite get it right. We do something like invent an atom bomb and we haven't yet morally processed what are the rules of the road for that one. I'm hoping that by reading about CRISPR and gene editing, we can have a good societal discussion to say, what should the rules of the road be? And um, I suspect it's gonna be hard to have one set of regulations. Our friend Peggy Hamburg, who was at Aspen Ideas Festival quite a bit over the past few years, she's a co-chair of the World Health Organization, looking at how do we create these rules. She said, you know, you can't enforce it. My, the character I talked about, Josiah Zayner, he does it in his garage. So it's going to be hard. It's not like an atom bomb where you can put a padlock on a nuclear reactor. Uh, it's going to be hard to police it, but I think we're going to have to. Well, and I think that brings us back to something you mentioned earlier, which was China and how far ahead they are of us in, you know, creating this technology and, and beginning to put it to use. You know, could you see a situation where China's got one set of ethical rules and we've got another and maybe, you know, other countries have, have their own? Will it all be different depending on where you live? Well, Peggy Hamburg said there will probably be what biologists call a mosaic. It'll be different. Just like in Europe, you can't have genetically modified organisms, you know, in your agriculture supply as much as we can. But let's get to China right away. China does have restrictions, but very famously, very explosively, the first CRISPR babies were born in China in November 2018. It surprised everybody. It was sort of a rogue scientist who knew how to do CRISPR, was at a fertility clinic, and he was able to genetically engineer twin girls that are alive today that have the receptor for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, cut out of them. And so that it's been edited out of them and their children and all their descendants, they won't have a receptor for HIV. So China has already done it. Now, to make it complicated, China's put the guy in jail too, said it was unauthorized. So not only do you have to have rules that China and everybody's gonna have to agree with, but you gotta be able to police rogue scientists. Do you know, um, do we know how those kids are doing? I mean, are they okay, these babies? We don't know very much, and boy, I've, I've gotten as much as I can for the book. They're a couple years old, the edits were not perfect. 
meaning they were, as I said, mosaics, that some cells escaped at it. It also wasn't medically necessary. There are other ways to prevent AIDS than editing out this receptor gene. But as far as we know, the twin girls are still alive, and uh, I hope they're being studied, because even though I think it was an outrage to do this before the timing was right and the safety was right, it'd be interesting to at least be able to get the medical data from how they're maturing. It would, and you know, you also have to wonder, was that really the only adaptation made to their, you know, to their genes? Well, one of the difficult things is when you have a gene like the CCR5 gene that has a receptor for HIV, that CCR5 gene sometimes does other things. There's indication that it makes you less immune to West Nile disease if you have it. So before we go tinkering with Mother Nature, it'd be useful to understand her. That, that is for sure. I'd like to talk for a second uh, a little more about Jennifer Doudna herself. Uh, I've had the pleasure also of, of talking to her for a book that we did at National Geographic, a, bo a book about women and groundbreaking women. And one of the things that she said to me was, you know, how the biggest hurdle that she had to overcome in her life, in her efforts to become a scientist, was really her own insecurity, that she just wasn't sure as a young woman, you know, growing up, whether she really had it in her to be this amazing scientist that she has turned out to be. Did she talk with you about any of that kind of thing? Totally, and that's one of the great themes of the book, because she's a pioneering woman scientist. And as I've written books about, you know, everybody from Einstein on back to, uh, you know, Franklin and Leonardo, the pioneers of science who are women don't usually get as much attention and they don't usually get as much encouragement. When Jennifer was growing up in Hilo, Hawaii, uh, she was sort of an outsider in Hawaii, but suddenly she learned to love nature, how the shy grass, it's called, would curl when you touched it, or why there were sort of eyeless uh, creatures and spiders in the caves, the lava caves of Hawaii. So she tells her advisor at high school she wants to become a scientist. And what does the guy tell her? Women don't become scientists. So your insecurity gets to start. But fortunately, her dad pushed her very hard. And her dad loved the idea that she was going to become a scientist. So yeah, she's filled, like we all probably are, with insecurities. And part of it is, can a woman become a scientist? Well, and I'm, I'm so delighted that you've decided to tell her story. I mean, if I, if I have this right, she's the first woman whose story you've really had the opportunity to tell, or you've, is that right? Absolutely. And, you know, she has helped mentor other women as well. And one of the wonderful things is if you look at the CRISPR field, it's collaborative, but a lot of them are women. You know, they did go into the life sciences. And a lot of the women were excluded from the hunt for DNA during the Human Genome Project, you know, led by Jim Watson and Francis Collins and Eric Lander, is all sort of a male, alpha male thing. And so these women started studying RNA, which is by far the more interesting cousin to DNA because it actually does work in the body. It goes out and builds the proteins that the DNA encodes. And so it's Jillian Banfield out in California, Emmanuel Charpentier, who becomes a partner uh, from born in Paris and living in Vienna, and a group of other women who uh, pushed forth this genetic revolution to have gene editing. Well, it's, it's really an encouraging story, and I hope a lot of young women will be encouraged by Jennifer's story. Jennifer, but let me mention on that, because Jennifer told me that when she was in middle school, her father put a paperback on her bed, and the paperback was The Double Helix by Jim Watson. And, and young Jennifer thought it was some detective or mystery story. And when she read it, she suddenly realized it is a detective and mystery story. It's about science, and that turned her on. But there's a character called, you know, named Rosalind Franklin, who never gets the credit she deserves for having done the photo that leads to the discovery of the structure of DNA. And what Jennifer said is by reading that book on my bedside when I was a middle schooler, it turned me on to the mystery and the detective hunt of science and also told me women could do it. I hope some other middle school kid, boys and girls, you know, pick up my book or other books like mine and say, yeah, I'm going to do that as well. Because in the age of coronavirus, those are the type of people we need. 
Well, that's for sure. And we need, we need all the help we can get. You know, finally, I remember Jennifer telling me she thought the characteristic that got her through, um, you know, got her through it whenever she was sort of feeling down or insecure was her own stubbornness. And did, did that come out to you? She's very stubborn. She's very persistent. I don't know if she told you, but she's also very competitive. Uh, sometimes people like to hide how competitive they are. But to me, it's a great trait in her. And that stubbornness and persistence said, look, I'm going to overcome this. She felt actually an outsider because she was an Anglo in a all Polynesian and Hawaiian community. She was a woman trying to do science. And look, one of the things you learn in science is you got to persist. Well, she's a she's a terrific character, and I'm glad that uh, your book is going to bring her story to uh, you know to the general public's attention. I mean, this really is one of the greatest breakthroughs in the last century. So, Walter, it has been a delight to talk to you today about Jennifer Doudna, and I really look forward to uh, to reading your story. Thank you so much, Susan. Please. Thanks, Walter. And now, reciting from Out the Cave by Joyce Sutphin is Aspen Words youth poet, Joe Altmeyer. From Out the Cave by Joyce Sutphin. When you have been at war with yourself for so many years that you have forgotten why. When you have been driving for hours and only gradually begin to realize that you have lost your way. When you have cut hastily into the fabric. When you have signed papers in distraction. When it has been centuries since you watched the sunset or the rain fall and the clouds drifting overhead pass as flat as anything on a postcard. When in the midst of all these everyday nightmares, you understand that you could wake up, you could turn and go back to the last thing you remember doing with your whole heart. That passionate kiss, the brilliant drop of love rolling along the tongue of a green leaf. And then you wake and you stumble from your cave, blinking in the sun, naming every shadow as it slips. And now we are joined by Eric Larson and John McWhorter for another Aspen Ideas conversation. Hi, everybody. I am John McWhorter. I teach linguistics at Columbia University, and I host the podcast about language lexicon valley. And I am elated to have the opportunity to speak to author extraordinaire Eric Larson, who may be best known to most of you for writing the masterful Devil in the White City, but right now we're gonna be talking mm -hmm. about the equally masterful, The Splendid and the Vile, which is his latest book, which is about the events surrounding and the events comprising the Blitz in England at the beginning of what we now know as World War II. And Eric, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I thoroughly enjoyed a lot of your books and you're up to all of your tricks. I don't know how you managed to tell a story in such a potato chip, can't stop eating it fashion. But I wanted to ask you Thank something you. which I kept asking mm -hmm. myself, as somebody who tries to write books and tries to come up with topics, what led you after writing about things like murderers at the Chicago World's Fair, about the sinking of the Lusitania, et cetera, to choose something as specific? Not that it isn't exciting, but something as specific as not just a history of World War II, you know, which was a pretty exciting time from the late 30s through the right. mid 40s, but what England went through within the period of basically a year. Why that? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it has to do with the, it goes back to when my family moved from Seattle to, my wife and I moved from Seattle to New York City and, and had this uh, epiphany about the nature of 9-11. Of I mean, this may sound like, you know, a real duh moment for those who actually live in New York, but, but you know, when we had watched the whole thing unfold in real time from, from Seattle on CNN. But then arriving in New York, I was, I was immediately struck by, by how different the experience had to have been for those who were in New York, especially this idea of your home city being attacked. So I actually set out at first to, to started thinking about doing the, doing a book about maybe a, a typical London family to see how they endured essentially, you know, the first phase of the Blitz, 57 consecutive nights of bombing. And then I started thinking, well, 
gee, why not do the quintessential London family? And I decided to, to do Churchill. That's, that's how I came up. That's how it got to be this very sort of specific thing. That's interesting because I think many authors would have chosen that family. That would be the fashion <laughs> these days to tell it up close and personal. It's about the potatoes. It's about uncle such and such who gets hurt when he steps outside, et cetera. But you did something that almost in a way is harder, which is that you took these events, which let's face it, have been covered by others. And yet <laughs> yep. you knew that you were going to be able to tell it in such a way that everybody would want to read it again. And what I came away from it with, and you know, I'm going to spare us and the audience with what everybody thinks is coming. I'm going to say something about COVID and the parallels. I'm sure you've answered those questions many times. We're going to leave that out. But when thinking about the Blitz, I must admit that my image is roughly Mrs. Miniver, you know, I've seen the movie and Greer Garson is sitting there knitting and you always think about how they got through it. And I must admit that it hadn't occurred to me that, for example, as you show in the book, almost 30,000 people died in London alone, 45,000 people in the UK in general, 5,600 of them were kids. I had never actually thought about that. And this is what I'm left with from your book. And I, this is a sincere question that I want to ask you, which is this. Churchill is a great man. We're always told that he's a great man. He's a massively entertaining man. But you see from your book, if you follow them from month to month, that Britain was about to lose. I mean, really, they, they couldn't have done it if America had not come in. So Churchill was pacing and smoking cigars and sending all these cute little notes and Hopkins and Harriman are coming over. But really, Churchill did these great speeches where he made everybody heartened but if America hadn't come in, then Britain would have lost anyway. And so I find myself thinking, I understand how magnetic Churchill was. I get that he's special. But I find myself wondering, what do we admire Churchill most for from this vantage point, other than, in a way, being an excellent and articulate cheerleader at a time when, nevertheless, if the US hadn't come in, Britain would have had to surrender to Germany. You know, complicated, <laughs> complicated question. Um, I, I, you know, I feel that I feel that um, uh, uh, well, Churchill's Churchill's view was that you, without the U.S., they couldn't win, but they could fight to a stalemate. And one of his goals was, one of his goals was to prevent it from being a, 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 an excessively long war. Not terribly successful on that front either, of course, but. But um, it was it was really his desire to 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 try to bring Roosevelt in so that the thing the war could come to a, to a, a quick end. What he was very good at was was reeling Roosevelt into the war to the extent that Roosevelt could come into it before Pearl Harbor. You know, um, Roosevelt was sympathetic, but he was in a very difficult situation in America, which wanted nothing to do with European entanglements and so forth. Also, Roosevelt was thinking about, but had not yet declared, his interest in running for an unprecedented third term. And so, so it was very, very tricky for Roosevelt. And um, uh, uh, Churchill, one of the things that he was particularly deft at was, was finally recognizing how tricky that was. I mean, initially, he just wanted Roosevelt to sort of declare himself and come on in. You know, that's the British thinking about how America should work. But, but what he, he realized was this is going to be a much more tricky, tricky affair but he also realized that within the first 24 hours that he would need America's help. There is, there's that moment in the book, he is shaving at his residence, he hadn't yet moved to 10 Downing Street, he is shaving at his residence uh, in Admiralty House and his ne'er-do-well son Randolph is sitting behind him challenging him on, on how Britain could possibly win the war. And Churchill, Churchill whirls, uh, uh, whirls around, throws his razor into the sink and says, I shall drag America in. That's from literally from day one of his premiership. And he went about it, as he himself later admitted, he went about it um, with, with all the skill and, and ardor of, of any lover who was pursuing his intended target. And, and, and so, so in, a, in a way, that in itself was a, a particular act of, of leadership genius on, on, on Churchill's part. But you know, you mentioned cheerleader. I think there is so much more to it than than the, 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 you know, him merely being a, a cheerleader. You know, this was, a, this was a period when I think Churchill really, you can say an awful lot of bad things about Churchill, and a lot of people do, but this was a period where Churchill really came into his own. And one of the things that he was particularly adept at 
was, it, we know he had all these wonderful lines, you know, never has so much been owed by so many to so few. But really, I think the, I think the beauty of his, his oratory, of his speeches, was the way he structured, the way he went about talking to this audience who knew that there was an existential threat out there. He was very candid. He, he, was, he was always, he began his speeches with a very sober assessment of the reality of the situation, sometimes too sober. I, he scared some of his audience to death with some of these speeches. And then he would follow with, with you know, a, a, an actual reasons for optimism, real reasons, not happy talk, real reasons. And then after that would come the flourishes, these, these wonderful, wonderful phrases that would really metaphorically, uh, but also, also literally get people you know, sort of jumping from their chairs thinking, okay, I'm, I'm in this now, I'm in this battle. And that was a really a significant thing. You know, he, he, this, this, was a, this was a powerful thing he did during that period. I definitely get that. And there's something else about um, the book that left me wondering, and this is a, l a little bit more frivolous, but I think that the audience should know what they're in for when they read this book, which is that you're a very, this is going to sound strange, very sensual person. You, know, you don't see many color photographs of the Blitz, and I feel like I don't need to because of some of the things you get across, such as that you could look at the bombs coming down in the sky, and in a way they were beautiful. Sometimes the parachute bombs look like flowers. Or that at one point a bomb has gone off, I think this is in Coventry, and you know, a, a tobacco shop is burning and it smells like a big man smoking a pipe. And you know, a butcher shop is burning and everybody's thinking, well, it actually smells like the meat that we can't get. You really make us feel that we're there. And even in Devil in the White City, you could smell the hot dogs, you could, you could smell the blood. How do you go about making it so that we are there in something that we feel like we've already been in before. What's your process on that? We don't, in, in, the, case of, in the case of Splendid and, and, and Vile researching this period, I mean, I was blessed with, believe me, there, 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 there are so many records and so many wonderful, wonderful diaries. It's the diaries that mm. really are the most important thing. Like you mentioned that you called it a parachute mine, but I think it was actually, was it Graham Greene who was talking about flares and how they look when they it were- It was flying. Graham Greene, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and so I'm, I'm always on the lookout for those things. These, these diaries have been read by many, many, many people, but I, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm looking for something very particular. I'm looking for those little itty bitty details. I mean, if I read an entire 400 page diary and all I get is, is one really telling little piece, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. Like one of the things I was really struck by doing the research for this book was, was one of the salient features of, of, of the Blitz was dust. Um, a bomb would fall on a house, um, and typically, typically the way the Germans timed uh, and, and, and built their bombs, the bomb would fall through that house, all the way through the house, all the way into the into the the, the earthen um, base underneath, and then detonate. So what you had was you had this, this effect of this entire structure going up all at once, and these these billowing plumes of dust rolling out into the street, dust that would coat people, coat cars, coat everything. I was really struck by that. That's the kind of thing that I, I'm really looking for, is like dust. And, and Graham Greene, in fact, uh, makes, a, makes a wonderful note in, in his, um, in his uh, autobiography, Means of Escape, where he has, um, uh, he, he talks about uh, uh, how, here's this, Here's this dust. You know, people are coated with dust, and then there's blood, and 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 how the blood is so garishly red against this background of dust. And we can all see that, right? We all know what that that's like. But I never would have thought about that except for these these diary accounts. You have a paragraph late in the book. Anybody who's reading this then thinks, well, then what happened? Even if you know what happened. So in Pearl Harbor. Yeah. You do one paragraph where you sum up World War II. And, you know, I don't have time to read it here, but it's just this perfect, almost Churchillian, Gibbonesque paragraph. You sum up World War II, you make it sound like a story that's never been told. A lot of people don't know that people who write nonfiction are writers. You notice how just like drink is shorthand for drinking alcohol, does he drink doesn't mean Sprite. Well, do you write means do you write novels? And yep. it's as if we nonfiction writers don't exist or there's something else that we do. Yet clearly you write. What 
what is your process in writing? Like mine is frankly to just sit down and crank it out and show it to somebody. I don't revise much. What, what is your process? Well, often people refer to me as a, as a, as a historian and, and, and I, I don't think of myself as a historian. I think of myself as a writer of history. I, I'm drawn not so much by the desire, not at all by the desire to inform. I am drawn by story. I am drawn to real life nonfiction, nonfiction subjects that, that have an inherent story, a natural narrative arc. Um, you ask about what's my, pro what's my process. I mean, I, I am so compulsive about rewriting and editing. I mean, you know, I could, I could, I, I have about, about four feet worth of drafts still in my, well, in my office. To me, it's, wow. to me that, to me that, and maybe you feel this, this way as well. To me, I, I, I am happiest. I feel, I just feel this wonderful sense of, oh, now I can really begin my writing life when I have the first draft done. Because then, you know, all the angst is gone. I know I have, well, most of the angst is gone. I know I have a book, you know, and now the trick is to make it a really good book. Now with this, I have to say, this was the toughest book that I have written thus far. How come? Because, well, because of the sheer volume of material that has been written about Churchill. You know, I had to make a strategic decision very early on that I wasn't going to try to touch bases just because the scholars wanted me to touch those bases. I also decided that because of my window, my, I had a very particular window, how on earth did Churchill, his family, and his advisors, how did they survive 57 consecutive nights of bombing and six more months of intensifying raids, but at longer intervals because, frankly, because, because of the weather? How did they do it? It was a very particular lens. And interestingly, nobody else had used that lens to look at Churchill before. And so, so I made a strategic decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn the landscape, the Churchillian landscape, but I am not going to try to read everything because that would be a fool's error. It's impossible. And then, yeah. And then I decided, okay, then, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to learn the landscape and then I'm going to go right into the archives, the primary materials, because that's where I really feel comfortable. And I was confident that with, well, reasonably confident that with my, with my lens, I would be able to find new things to say about Churchill. Now, I'm not saying that nobody went through these documents before, nobody went through these archives before, but, you know, each scholar brings to the subject something very, very different. I, with my lens, I was looking for particular things that, frankly, most historians would probably, most biographers, whatever, most would probably have ignored. And actually, this is one reason I don't use any research assistance, because I'm not convinced that somebody else would have my instinct about what, what to look for. I feel the same way. Yeah. yeah. And so, so, so going into the, the archives, I was actually delighted to find that I am able to say new things. I also got extremely lucky you know, getting some access to some, some materials that, that, that I, I don't believe were actually ever effectively used. I can't wait to see what the next thing will be. Who said splendid and vile? You know that I wanted to end this by saying, as the great, and I know it was in your book, but I couldn't find it this morning. That yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, so the title, um, the title derives uh, directly from, from uh, uh, one character's diary. This is John Colville, who it's was Colville. One, of, okay. one of Churchill's um, private secretaries. He, he was one of his cadre of, of private secretaries. I, I actually think of them actually as apprentice prime ministers. They were very smart, very hardworking young men. John Colville is one of these. He's a character in his own right in, in, in this book. Um, and, and he kept a very, against all national security laws, he kept a very detailed daily diary of life at 10 Downing Street. It's, it's the touchstone for everybody who writes about Churchill. But one night, one night, um, he, he is watching an air raid from a bedroom window, as one does. He's watching an air raid from a bedroom window, and he is struck by the beauty of the night. There's this, it's this sable sky, searchlights, bombs blowing up. You know, it's just, he, he is struck He makes it by, sound beautiful, exactly. Well, he is struck by the sheer beauty of the night. And he talks about it being a juxtaposition of, of, of natural splendor and human vileness. And right as, well, as soon as I read that, I thought, that's my title, The Splendid mm. and the Vile. That must have felt great. Eric, you wrote a wonderful book. And Thank I you. am really glad that I was asked to read it. One, one final thing. Churchill spoke like a leader. He was very conscious of doing that. I think even more than most people of his time. Is that an old fashioned quality that we might dismiss just like we would dismiss whatever toilet water or cologne or cigar that he used? Or is it something we could do with better today? And I don't mean Trump, that's too easy. 
let's say that we're just talking about a normal president. Nevertheless, yeah. that president would not communicate like Churchill. Are we missing something? We, we are, we're totally missing something. And I, and I hope that we, I hope that we get it back. But you know, you know, it, it cuts to all the, all the broad palette of things that actually made Churchill in this time, uh, in this time, a true leader and the ideal leader. It wasn't just his, wasn't just his speeches. It's also the fact that the man for all his, you know, for all his, his rapier wit and so forth, the man had a lot of compassion. He had this knack for being able to express empathy and, and having people understand that it was a real thing. But he also had this, this real, he, he understood the power of symbolic acts. That if he was if he was fearless, if he showed himself to be fearless, and he was, if he showed himself to be fearless, others would be fearless as well. I mean, courage, you know, fearlessness is in, in fact infectious. But there's a final little subtle thing that I love about I love about Churchill during this period, and and again, I have to say during this period you can you can find an awful lot that's awful about about Churchill, but but one very compelling thing that he did during this period during his speeches is another aspect of his speeches. Because he was so well read, because he had he had a, a great understanding of the broad, grand sweep of English history, he was able to insert his audience, the the the, the, the beleaguered Londoners and you know people getting bombed out of their homes and so forth. He was able to insert their challenge, their travails into the broad history of Britain, and make them feel as if they were part of that grand history and that they had a role in carrying it on. And that's that's a real art as is the art of letting interviews go when one is out of time. Eric, <laughs> it has been an absolute honor. I'm glad that we could talk about this. Thank you, John. And, and I'm sorry we had to do it under these pandemic conditions, but maybe next time. We shall see. Thank you. Thank you. The Aspen Ideas Festival is generously underwritten by Allstate, the Mount Sinai Health System, Prudential, and the Walton Family Foundation with support from PayPal and the RISE Fund. And now, another big idea. I'm Connie Evans, President and CEO of the Association for Enterprise Opportunity. The lack of bank credit for Black businesses is widening the racial wealth gap. There is a $7 billion credit gap annually for Black-owned businesses. Now, enter COVID-19. To limit the pandemic's economic damage, the government and private companies are turning on the spigot to get money flowing to small businesses, like the $10 million grant program for Black businesses, a partnership between AEO and PayPal. But recovery from COVID-19 shouldn't just return us to the economy that existed before the shutdown, where huge wealth and income disparities make Black businesses struggle for growth and survival, a constant struggle. This year, the federal government will issue almost $1 trillion in loan guarantees through about 70 separate programs. Yet, Black-owned businesses will struggle to get the money they need. My big idea is for the federal government to guarantee all loans made by Black banks and Black-led community development financial institutions for Black-owned firms. The guarantee will create a market of investors to buy these loans. And with a small investment, financial institutions could easily make hundreds of millions of dollars in loans each year. This would close the $7 billion capital gap, strengthen Black-owned businesses, create wealth and jobs. Thank you. Up next, Jillian Tett and Hank Paulson. Hello and welcome. I'm Gillian Tett. I'm US Editor-of-Large at the Financial Times, and I'm joined today with Hank Paulson, former Treasury Secretary and Chairman of the Paulson Institute. Welcome, Secretary Paulson, or Hank, if I may. Um, now, there's been a lot of comparisons made in the last few months in this extraordinary time for America with the events of 2008 and 2009, and even before that, and you were at the very epicenter of the last great financial crisis. So with that experience, because you were Treasury Secretary then, 
How do you evaluate the current state of the U.S. economy? Uh, Jillian, first of all, it's great to be with you today. And th this is obviously a very different uh, circumstance than we encountered in 2008. But the way I look at it today is uh, obviously the, you know, the economic recovery to a large extent is going to be determined by our ability to control the d disease, uh, the, the likelihood of future flare-ups, uh, and, and by the willingness of the American people to go back uh, to work and resume something uh, like normal business activities. But what is really important to keep in mind is the economy was quite healthy and the financial markets quite healthy when we were hit by the pandemic. And no, number one, number two, there has been a massive, and I mean massive fiscal stimulus uh, program and a massive uh, intervention to support the capital markets by, by the U.S. Federal Reserve. And the American people, at least it looks today, as if they are, have been less traumatized than some might have feared, and there seems to be a greater willingness to go back, back to work. So do you see, can I quickly interrupt, do you see that then as a V or a U or a L, as some people are saying? So I, I see this as a, 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 a U, but it, it, it's... I'm going to modify it this way. The way I think about it is, let's say 25 million people lost their jobs when the economy shut down. I think that barring any, you know, a future flare-up with the disease, I think it's highly likely that 50 to 60 percent of those jobs will come back before the end of the year, a lot in the third quarter. I think it's likely that some of the other jobs will come back more slowly, and maybe 20 or 25% of the jobs aren't gonna come back at all uh, for a variety of reasons. There have been a number of businesses that were probably destined to fail anyway, like big box department stores. Uh, very successful companies have learned that they don't need a, a layer of management. And so I think you're gonna see layoffs of, uh, of white collar workers and, uh, and they're not gonna need all the space. So as I look at it, under the best case, we get a very quick uh, uh, resurgence of a big part of the economy, but we're going to have eight to ten, at least eight to ten percent unemployment at the end of the year, and it's going to be a, a multi-year uh, problem working through this uh, structural unemployment. So maybe it's more like a Nike swoosh, as they say, or a square root sign, or as so happens as someone who once studied shorthand that the shorthand symbol for bank is like a square root sign. So <laughs> I used to tease people who were involved in finance after the great financial crisis that that was quite relevant. But, um, but I'm curious, you know, you pointed out that Congress has already unveiled this massive stimulus package and this eye-poppingly large support package from the Fed. Do you think more is now needed from Congress as we look forward in the coming months and if so, what should they do exactly? Should it be more help for small businesses? You know, should we be do, doing more bond buying programs? I and mean, what's actually needed at the moment? If you were Treasury Secretary, what would you recommend Secretary Mnuchin does? Julian, the first thing I'm going to recommend is waiting a while. So I, I really think we should to take more time to digest what has happened. Put this in perspective, the stimulus program is really been $500 billion per month, which is on an annualized basis is 30% of GDP. The world has never seen anything like this. And the Fed has added you know, $3 trillion to its balance sheet. Now I think uh, Secretary Mnuchin has done a magnificent job. Congress has done a great job coming together. Jay Paul's done a great job, but let's digest this and, and, and make sure that we see how it's working fully before taking the next step. But I think it is highly likely that the next step should include some stimulus for state and local governments to, to replace some of the revenues they've lost due to the pandemic. I think there should be a, a focus on schools and they've been hit very, very hard. Uh, there's, I think gonna, we're gonna continue to need some targeted relief or stimulus to the most vulnerable uh, part of our population, those most in need. And I think something that clearly has got to be fixed is 
the unemployment bonus. Right now, uh, there is a very generous unemployment uh, uh, compensation plan that phases out at the end of July or ends at the end of July, which pays unemployed workers at the level of fifty thousand dollars a year. Now, it, 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 it's even more significant than that because there's no withholding on the unemployment. So that's a big adverse incentive to to starting up the economy again. So I think there's gonna to have to be some way of dealing with that. But all in all, you know, I, I, I give big plaudits to, to Congress, to Mnuchin and to the Fed. Now, of course, the downside of this extraordinary stimulus package is that debt is exploding. Um, it's exploding in America, it's exploding in the emerging markets. I mean, let's talk about the emerging markets in a minute. Let's talk about America first. How concerned are you about this exploding American debt burden? And are you concerned that it's basically going to force the Federal Reserve into a position where they have to keep low rates low for almost the indefinite future? I mean, they're now looking until 2022, um, simply because the debt servicing costs will just be too high if rates go up. Well, Julian, you've framed that question magnificently. And it's one I get a lot. And the, the way I always answer it is as follows. First of all, I am very, very concerned about our structural deficit. And here I'm talking about the deficit that comes from uh, very expensive entitlement programs, the demographic trends in the US with the aging of America, and a big revenue shortfall. I look at this stimulus as not being part of the structural uh, uh, deficit. This is something that is highly necessary in order to, to get people working and paying taxes. We're not gonna be able to do anything until we do that. So in that sense, it's accretive. And you're right in pointing out, we can manage this if the Fed keeps interest rates low for, for, for a number of years. But I will tell you, if we don't solve the structural deficit pro problem, this is gonna cripple our prosperity for years to come. It's gonna cripple our ability to lead internationally. It's gonna destroy the dollar as a global reserve currency. So we need, a, we need to really flatten that curve of the, uh, of the structural deficit. I think the good news here is we're a rich country and there's a lot we can do. We have a very inefficient healthcare program. So there's a lot that can be done there. And there's a lot of ways we can increase taxes without destroying our economy where the, uh, where the rich pay more. Right. I must say it's fascinating because, you know, six months ago, most of us had never heard of the concept of flattening the curve. And now we're trying to flatten every single curve we can find, whether it's medical curve, the bankruptcy curve, the debt curve, anything. That's going to end up being one of the phrases of 2020, I think. Yeah, and I'll tell you, the curve of the structural deficit, it is really alarming if you look out a number of years. Yeah. And I actually, and I actually think that's what the markets are going to look at. The markets, what will, what will cause the markets to, to really rebel uh, will be not the spending we've had to do to deal with, with, with the pandemic, the necessary spending. But if we don't show a willingness to, to, to flatten that curve of the structural deficit, there'll be a big problem. And hopefully this spending for the pandemic will will increase the focus on the need to do just what I said. Yeah, I'm waiting to see some someone on Wall Street to create the FTC index for flatten the curve, knowing how much everyone loves acronyms. Um, but actually, before I ask about the shape of the post pandemic recovery and the environmental issue that I know you're passionate about, I do want to ask so about whether you're at all concerned that keeping rates ultra low at almost zero, you know, for the next two or three years, which is pretty much indefinitely as far as most market traders are concerned, whether that's going to create new problems as well. Because I hear a lot of my friends say, well, haven't we had big debt bubbles in the past? Haven't we had, you know, all kinds of crazy behavior in the markets when rates are ultra low? Doesn't that worry you at all? Julian, that's not my major worry here. My, my, my worry, I, I see very little sign of inflation coming. Uh, even in, in parts of the world where the economy is coming back quickly, like in China, it's coming back on the supply side. The demand side looks looks very weak. 
And so I, I think that the, the thing I'd be more concerned about globally would be deflation. And what, and I think it, it's a luxury that we have the ability, thank goodness we have the ability that, that other nations may not have in, 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 in the emerging markets and so on to keep interest rates low while we manage through this problem. Now, this is not anything any of us wanted to do or, you know, in, in, in a normal course of things uh, would be doing, but this is something that needs to be done today. And, and, and again, I, I'm looking beyond this period because I, I agree with you. I think that we need to be, be looking beyond the pandemic, beyond this crisis, and be thinking about some of the more important structural, the fundamental things we need to do to, to shape the recovery. But during the early stages of the recovery, the fact that interest rates can be kept very low, I think is important. Well, let's talk then about the future in a broader sense, because one of the things that I did about a year ago at the Financial Times um, was to set up a platform called Moral Money which is basically looking at environmental issues, green finance, socially responsible finance, and things like that. And I know it's a topic that has been very dear to your heart for a long time on the environmental, the green side. You fought very hard to promote green as a policy imperative. Are you concerned that this crisis is going to knock away any energy behind the green agenda um, or do you think it may actually accelerate it? And if so, what are the really important issues there? So, Jillian, yeah, this is a huge topic. And you know what I believe. I, I believe that climate change poses the most certain, predictable, significant risk uh, on a global basis to economic security, national security, political stability, the health of the planet, the well-being of our inhabitants. So I, I, I think that's a huge issue, number one. Uh, uh, the second thing I'd say here is that this pandemic has given people a glimpse of, of, of what a, a clean environment might look like, right? And given them a greater appreciation for, for the natural world. But you're very right in, in saying that when we come out of this, if we revert to the old practices and policies and do things that we've done in the past, these problems are going to come back with, with in a more acute manner. It's, it, it's going to be worse. And, and so as I look at it, I'm going to look first at the bright spots. And, you know, the EU, well, you're right there. So you see it. So the EU has said, right, climate change is going to be at the center of their recovery agenda and development agenda for years to come. And there's no doubt about it. I, I, I think that's for, for sure. It, 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 in China, they, for, for a couple of years, even before the pandemic, they were much more focused on the environment overall and the, the visible signs of pollution than they were on carbon emissions, which were coming up. But at least it, in China, they have, again, a big part of their recovery it, it is going to be uh, some of these uh, green infrastructure projects and clean energy and so on. Uh, so, so that's a positive. Now, in the U.S., we're going to have to wait, you know, until after the election to see what what, what the agenda will be in, in the U.S. It will be very much determined by, by by the agenda, at least at the national level. But, you know, in, in the U.S., there are a lot of other things, and I I, I sure expect. You know, sure, I, I sure hope that green recovery is a part of what what we see in, in the U.S. But there are some other structural changes that are very, very important in the U.S. also to make sure that our our economy works after the pandemic, for sure. Well, just to come on the climate side first, though, um, one, I mean, in our newsletter covering this at the Financial Times, Moral Money, um, we've written a lot about this incredibly interesting debate in Washington that's gone almost entirely unnoticed by most of the media to do with the Republican Party and the carbon dividend. And there is a group of mainstream Republicans who are pushing very hard for what could be a bipartisan drive towards trying to look at carbon taxes, carbon prices, but with a dividend. Is that the kind of idea that you would support? And could that be 
the basis for a swift for a shift in the Republican Party after the next election towards more of a green agenda that could create bipartisan action. So I was one of the first advocates, along with with, with Ted Halstead and uh, and George Schultz and Jim Baker, of of, of that dividend. And, and and the reason I was was because it hit all the the critical points in the Republican agenda. Okay, so there was going to be a, a border tax, a border adjustment. Uh, this was going to be, if you're concerned about big government, this was going to be given back to the people and, and, and so on. So I thought that was important. My own belief is that that's a single issue topic. And so my own belief is that there's a high likelihood in the next you know, several years, we will have some kind of a price on carbon but that we need the revenue so badly to deal with the deficit. And we're the only nation in the world, major country that doesn't have a national consumption tax. My own view is that to do something on a bipartisan basis, uh, it, it may be the funding potential of the carbon tax would be, or, or the, carbon, the carbon fee, whatever you want to call it, would be the key to getting something done and it could help fund a major infrastructure program. Right. But do you think the Republicans will go green? Well, let me tell you, I think plenty of Republicans care about the environment and they care about clean energy. So I, I think the key thing is not Republican versus Democrat. I think it's the American people. One of the, thing, one of the things that I learned, you know, we, when, when Obama was president, or I'll go back to when I was Treasury Secretary, and I would go say things to to uh, to Democrats and ask them what they thought about climate change. And before they knew where I was on it, they'd say to me, "Oh yeah, I'm saying positive things about climate change, but don't worry, I'm from an auto state or I'm from a coal state, and, and, and so on." So I think this will be driven by the American people. I think the American people increasingly care about the environment, and. Uh, what, what I can say about a carbon tax is we're going to need the revenues and uh, revenues to fund things that are going to be very essential. And, and, and I think we're going to need the equivalent of a domestic Marshall Plan to rebuild our infrastructure. And that's going to take government revenues. It's going to take private sector, sector revenues. It, it's going to take uh, regulatory reform. But, and it needs to be focused on the future, not just on greening our country, but on updating our infrastructure, our digital uh, communication software, getting us ready to compete in the world of 5G, broadband. There's a lot that's going to need to be done. And I've got to tell you, another issue we have in our country is the incentives all seem to be towards spending and borrowing as opposed to saving. So, so in that respect, a a, a some form of consumption tax wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. One last question, really, because um, um, we're sadly almost out of time. When you were Treasury Secretary, you played a huge role in the great financial crisis in corralling other governments around the world to provide a coordinated response to crisis. Um, the G7 was still functioning. The G20 was essentially given a new boost of life. Um, there was a sense of international collaboration. What we have now is, in many ways, a breakdown of international collaboration. Um, people talk about a G0, and the Bretton Woods institutions look increasingly frayed, um, if not ineffective. Are you concerned by this breakdown in international collaboration? Um, you know, obviously, the US-China relationship is part of that, but more broadly, and is it time for a Bretton Woods 2.0? Do we have to get ambitious and rethink how we collaborate financially? Jillian, you and I are on the same wavelength. Uh, the, the, the pandemic has shown a bright light on the breakdown on our, our, our global institutions and, and really the, the need for, for, for effective global governance. And the, the way I look at it is this. We can't have an effective economic recovery un unless we have some global rules that work for trade, for investment, 
for intellectual property, for technology standards. We also need multilateral banks that can do a better job when dealing with some of these nations that are suffering huge hum humanitarianism uh, disasters and, you know, and, and bouts of economic stability. And the WTO, as is constituted, doesn't work in today's world. W we need to redo that. The multilateral banks, uh, you know, need more financial capacity and pr probably less governance. And I don't blame the institutions. The, the fault here is the members have got to get together and do the hard work to update them to work in today's world. The problems are glaring, we have to do the work. And the US government needs to lead and, you know, and, and these are institutions that the Trump administration has largely tried to emasculate. The US government needs to lead, but it, it just has to be part of the solution. There has to be a, a, a number of a major economies, G20 economies, that, uh, th that come together. And so I think the time is, is coming when we need to think about what's the right process, what's the right framework to begin uh, updating the Bretton Woods institu institutions. And what the pandemic has shown, this was a very predictable crisis, and yet we weren't ready to deal with it. So we can just tick off all the other predictable crises, right? You've already talked about climate change, but 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 cyber terrorism, uh, cyber theft, uh, nuclear proliferation. There's a whole set of issues, and we need to rethink our treaties, our protocols, our institutions, and that can only be done if we come together. And China's got to be part of it. And if China and the U.S. can't find a way to work together on these things, the world's going to be a very dangerous place. Well, on that note, I think you've talked yourself into writing a book called Bretton Woods 2.0 with a Chinese twist, perhaps, um, or a green twist as well. Um, but or else back to flatten the curve. Anyway, I really appreciate you sharing our thoughts with our Secretary Paulson. Um, it's been very, very interesting to hear the broader perspective on this because we do tend to all get very sucked into the here and now at the moment and very breathless consumption of you know, Twitter and other social media platforms. So thank you very much indeed and best of luck in your fight to not only focus us all on the green agenda, but also the need for more global cooperation. Thank you. And Jillian, thank you. In addition to the majestic backdrop and the texture of the Aspen Institute campus, a constant of the Aspen Ideas Festival has been our partnership with The Atlantic, one of America's most respected publications. The Aspen Institute team has cherished the collaboration with the team at The Atlantic. This year, we'll miss the witty opening remarks of Atlantic Chairman David Bradley, the inquisitive Jeffrey Goldberg with his disarming humor, and all the editors, staff writers, and members of the event team that have been a partner in producing the Aspen Ideas Festival over the last 16 years. Last year, during the annual Afternoon of Conversation, a signature of the Aspen Ideas Festival, The Atlantic helped bring Pop-Up Magazine, and with it, a segment that included our next presenter, the American soprano, Emily Bursan, who is accompanied on the piano by Yasko Ora. Allegra sol 
Thank you so much for joining us here on day four of the Aspen Ideas Festival. I'd like to give a great big thank you to all of our speakers and presenters and interviewers who gave so generously of their time and insight and own ideas. To our sponsors who took a leap of faith in a time that we've never done anything like this before, as we jumped into this new format, thank you. To the festival team, both here in Washington, D.C., you just rock. 
And of course, the biggest thanks of all are for you, for seeking the festival out and for seeking answers and interesting solutions to the problems that we face. We really look forward to pursuing more ideas tomorrow and hope you'll join us. Thank you. Please join us again tomorrow, day five of the 2020 Aspen Ideas Festival at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The exceptional lineup includes Aspen Institute President and CEO Dan Porterfield in conversation with Brian Green, Krista Tippett in conversation with Lulu Miller, Michael Eric Dyson, Alicia Garza, and Eugene Scott, as well as Mitt Romney and Lonnie Chen, and an Ideas Festival exclusive performance with our friend violinist Bobby McDuffie.